There are eight people in the world who can truly say that they were students of Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, that's because he taught one class in his entire life. He happened to go to Morehouse College, and there were eight people in that class. There's probably, I would call it an act of fate, but in the cathedral, I will say it was divine providence, that one of those eight people, when he was just a young student at Morehouse, was Julian Bond. What was it like to have the Reverend Dr. King as a teacher? Well, this was a class he co-taught with a man named Dr. Samuel Williams, who had taught King philosophy when King had been a student at Morehouse College. And it was supposed to be a survey course, all the great philosophers, Plato, late Aristotle, down the line. But it became mostly a discussion of first the Montgomery bus boycott, which is fresh in our minds, and what King would do next and what he was doing now. And it, the odd, oddity for me is that I've talked to most of my co-students, and almost to a man and woman, we have no memory of what was really discussed. And we, <laughs> none of us thought to bring a tape recorder to class to, so we could tape whatever it was King said, whatever it was. Wait, King by the said. way, was he famous then? Yes, but not the way he's famous now. Yeah, yeah. But he was famous then. He had, Montgomery was just behind him. Um, he was a well-known figure, well-known personality. He had moved back to Atlanta from Montgomery, had taken a position as co-pastor of his father's church. So he was famous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what were you, when, when he went to the Birmingham jail, you had already formed the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, right. SNCC. You did that when you came out of Morehouse, or when you were a student, I guess, at Morehouse. Tell me about your relationship and the relationship of SNCC to what was happening in Birmingham. Well, you know, some of these civil rights scenes were fixed in, in, the, in the thought of the people who were in charge. Birmingham was an SCLC activity, not a Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Not Southern an, Christian Leadership Conference, yes, which was not Dr. An, King's organization. Yes, not an NAACP activity not a Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, it was an SCLC activity. And people in SNCC, people in the NAAC may have been there, but it was their activity. It's like Selma was initially a SNCC activity and then Dr. King came and it became a Dr. King activity. So in Birmingham was not a place you would go to just to go join the movement. Uh, it's a place you'd go to to say, how can I help here? What can I do? And uh, I was only in Birmingham two or three times during the whole stretch of the movement there. So it was somebody else's work. And how did you become uh, reunited with Dr. King as part of the movement? Well, he and, let, Can you all hear in the back? He... If you'll speak up a okay. little, Dr. He, uh, Mr. he and I both lived in Atlanta. I saw him in the grocery store. I saw him here. I saw him there. Um, he came to mass meetings that the Atlanta student movement had. So he was a constant presence in, in my life. I saw him all the time, talked to him all the time, um, and there he was. Did you ever hear his father preach, Julian? Oh, many times, yes. Wait, I speak up, yeah. I heard him speak one time, uh, some, some occasion, I don't remember what it was, and somebody asked him to give the invocation. He said, I'm the great invocator. <laughs> this is Daddy King. Daddy King, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And did he, um, I mean, did Dr. King, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, develop that sense of cadence, do you think, I'm sure, from a preacher's I'm sure, pulpit? I don't, I don't know that he did, but I'm sure he did. You couldn't grow up in that household without getting something, absorbing something from his father, because his father was such a powerful man, such a shorter than, he, than Martin, but just a powerful, powerful man. <laughs> Looked like somebody you didn't want to mess with. <laughs> this whole letter, is I think Dr. King uses the fierce urgency of now in various mm -hmm. contexts. He also says in other contexts that the arc of history bends, slow, or the arc of progress or history bends slowly, but it bends towards justice. Why back then was time of the essence? Well, I think this is an attack on, on moderates. Not an attack on moderates, but it's saying to moderates, what are you doing? What, what, what's your answer to these problems? Why are you having these fancy words about things. 
you know, we're, we're in real trouble. We need something done about it. And you're talking about taking time, 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 time. This is an attack on, on the American white moderate who uh, believes more, I can't remember the, the phrase, more about time than something else. Uh, but it's, it's as if King is angry at these people. Unless I take him to be angry and saying, you're just not doing anything and you should be doing something. And Dr. King says something that's almost breathtaking, if I remember from the letter, saying, the problem may be decent people like you. Yes. The White Citizens Council, I can know how to deal with. Right. Uh, explain that to me. Well, he's saying that, you know, you, in the world, we like to think that it's these people in sheets and robes that are really causing the trouble. But we, we can take care of them. It's you people who are doing absolutely nothing but talking and talking and talking, and that's all you do, and it's all you're going to do. You're never going to do anything. You just talk, 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 and you're wasting time and you're killing us because you're, you're taking our time away. Did you feel that time was not on your side the way the letter sort of expresses? Well, no, I, I thought we thought, and probably wrongly, that time was on our side, that we were winning things. If I think about the, the time the sit-ins began in Atlanta, and they're over pretty quickly because we won. And then the Freedom Rides came along and bam, they're over pretty quickly because we won. And then the 64 Voting Rights, Civil Rights Act was passed, and it wasn't perfect, but it was passed. Then the, the Voting Rights Act in 65 came along, bam, it was passed. So I felt that time was rushing, not as fast as I wanted it to, but faster than I ever thought it would. When did you get elected to the House, the in, State uh, House? 1960, uh, gee, I can't remember. 65, I think. I think it was 65. 65. And that shows how fast. Yeah. I mean, definitely. Yeah, the court ordered, ordered that to happen, but it happened. It happened. Yeah. You stood up to some of the black churches in order to be in favor of both gay and lesbian rights, and I think same sex marriage in California. Did you have a problem with the black church there, and why did you do it? A little problem because. There was a survey I read someplace, I don't know who took it, showing that black people were the least resistant, or the most resistant to the idea of same-sex marriage of all the people in the, in the country. And I remember going to a, a, something at the Kennedy Center and being harassed by three black ministers telling me I was killing the black church. And of course, I'm because not, I'm not doing anything of the sort because I was uh, promoting the idea that two men could get married if they wanted to, two women could get married if they wanted to, and the church said no to that, and therefore I was killing the black church. I mean, it's a stupid argument made by stupid people, but there you go. <laughs> and why were you in favor of it? Did you see it as a moral cause? Well, I just thought, you know, I've been fond of saying that I don't believe there's such, such a thing as gay rights. They're just rights. There's not such a thing as black rights. They're just rights. And we all have these rights. And I knew too many gay people from my earlier years, my high school years, my college years, people who work with me in the movement, that I couldn't say to them, well, thanks for helping me, appreciate it, but I'm not gonna help you. Of course, I couldn't say that. And so I, I felt bound to do it, and I, I did it, and I was glad to do what I could. Last year, I got arrested at the White House protesting the pipeline. And it was something I've always thought I was a good environmentalist. I believed in clean water, fresh air, all those things. And had never done anything about it, never given any money to anybody about it, never done a thing about it, never raised my voice about it. And it was approached by people to do this, and I did it. And it was awfully uncomfortable to get arrested and to have your hands locked behind your back, painful. Uh, but I felt so great having done it. It's just a wonderful thing that I did. And I was so happy about myself. I want to get that feeling over and over again and, uh, <laughs> and, and do, some, do it some more. And we should be shocked out of our complacency about the way we're stewards of this planet. Absolutely.